hello to the chess chicos and the chess chicas welcome back to the channel i haven't been uploading videos because i had a sore throat i still do but i'm doing my best to stay on top of it and uh upload videos today on the menu is going to be a topic that is uh, very fascinating and it always excites me to talk about this it's gonna be none other than the uncastled king or the king stuck in the middle what i want to tell tell you about uh, the topic in this video is is that my recent experience with my students about this topic is is that we tend to err fairly infrequently uh, very rarely um, on the side of not castling and not securing the king and um, therefore losing games. This doesn't seem to happen as often as us not paying enough attention to the fact that our opponent king is in the middle and often we do not play forceful, powerful, aggressive enough chess to home in on that king that is stuck in the middle. And uh, that's where this topic, I think, becomes a little bit more relevant. So today I'm going to show you a couple of games and I'm, what I'm going to try to do is to highlight different approaches and mental, or rather I should say, attitudes towards uh, how we observe the opponent's king depending on what's happening in the game. So I'm going to kick off with two games of my own. Uh, both of them were recent uh, games. This one is uh, basically just uh, following my own opening recommendation in uh, my beginner's E4 repertoire. And so we are following this Alapin line. And in fact, we are going into deep theory, according to my course, that is. Although I forgot my course, which is queen g4 here. Um, and only after whatever black does, do we move the rook or the bishop, depending on what's needed. I played rook e1 first. But after rook d8, queen g4, we actually transposed back into my recommended main line. Now, what I want to tell you about this particular position is that, in my opinion, this is the easiest one out of the three I'm going to show you in terms of it's crystal clear that the black king is stuck in the middle. And it's also crystal clear that that is white's only compensation for the isolated pawn. In fact, two pairs of pieces have been traded off. And so black is kind of there. If they manage to castle, black is definitely gonna pull the head. But it's quite difficult to accomplish because the bishop can't move because the GC, G7 pawn is hanging. And there are also tempting um, options there for black, for example, taking the pawn on D4, which of course was left there on purpose. My opponent did take it to my greatest delight because that means that I get to develop and they are still two moves away from castling. So happy days. They played bishop e7 and I played rook a d1. From here on out, in fact, already from here on out, my only agenda is, is to do not allow my opponent to castle or only allow it uh, in a way that is going to um, hurt them big time or I can somehow recuperate material or damage their position hopefully beyond repair so we are now just going after them and this is what I really like to call as the simplest chest against an uncastled king because all you need to do is just punch 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 and every single move must be super aggro and super on point take take bishop e5 or knight e4 doesn't really make a big difference perhaps knight e4 is even better because of the incoming knight d6 check and it, already here i knew that uh, black was in big trouble because it was a blitz game and in a blitz game to figure out defense when you know that this check is coming and the king is now guaranteed gonna be stuck in the middle is difficult really really challenging and already here i envisaged the finish of the game the predictor blunder concept uh, came to the fore here which i uh, also put on twitter and it was none other that i played queen f3 with the idea of taking the pawn and penetrating via the queen side tempting my opponent to shut this down with knight d5 which of course allowed queen takes d5 a marvelous finish the queen is taboo due to the mate on e8 so that was a fairly clean game you could see very very clearly that uh, the black king was in the middle and indeed white's main agenda from here on out was to ensure that the king never got to castle and uh, that was it on that note by the way uh, i do hope that those of you guys who use my beginners e4 managed to score a couple of nice victories like this um and on that note we are going to move on to my next game 
Um, this time around I'm playing the Open Sicilian and we are going to end up in an uh, English attack. Now, in the English attack, it's a really fascinating and exciting battle between two sides, usually castle to opposite wings, but even if the Black King excuse me, doesn't castle white, usually lunges forward with these pawns, trying to break up black's pawn formation and somehow get to that black king. Super exciting, super fun opening. I play it with both colors, um, but to be fair though, almost always it is a little bit more fun to play this with white because white usually is the first one to strike uh, in this setup. Now, multiple mistakes and inaccuracies were made. I would like to get to this point, even here, Although it's very clear to me that the Black King is exactly as many moves away from castling as it was in the previous case, I would argue that white strategy doesn't purely revolve around the Black King in that it's not like, oh, if they castle, then we are going to be in so much trouble. And therefore, the approach to attacking the king is also different because, in fact, in some ways, we almost prefer this king to be castled here so that the pawn storm can hit them really, really hard. And so I don't know how clear is what I'm clear it is for you. What I'm trying to say is, uh, is that my mentality here against the Black King is not necessarily to keep it in the middle at all cost, but still it's in the forefront of my thinking that Black King is the target, whether it stays here or it castles. So I played Knight back and I had a vague notion here about a line that I looked at more than 20 years ago, no joke, about take, take, bishop e7, and then either knight g3, f4, or f4 right away with a subsequent f5. And despite the fact that white has the two knights against black's two bishops, white's position is slightly preferable because we very clearly, we very clearly have a vision of an attack on the king side whereas black's initiative on the queen side is far less obvious. The engine holds this usually with black like a champion, but uh, for a human, to play this with black looks very, very unpleasant. <clears throat> anyway, my opponent here, to my greatest surprise, went d5, to which I responded incorrectly, by the way, by taking it. Apparently, f4 is a genius of a move here. And I love this move, by the way, because it's so out of the ordinary and unusual with the idea of f5. And of course, takes is impossible due to knight takes e6 and other tactical ideas. And otherwise, we just keep on rolling and trying to crack the position open. e d5 was a slight mistake, queen d5. Here I made another mistake, which I would have never thought that it was one. But by now, my mindset has shifted from generic attack to I need to destroy that king before it castles. And the reason for that is, is because with the dis disappearance of the e-pawn, somehow I felt like the position opened up more for the bishops. And so the longer the game goes on, the more likely that those bishops are going to be meaningful um, in one way or another, whether it's the defense or the attack against my king or just simply exerting pressure in the center. So as soon as I took, I went like, I'm going to go after you. Now, I did it very poorly, but here there was a very clear mental shift. If you compare that to the previous game, it, as soon as the opening was over, it was like, yep, yeah, this is do or die, the king can castle. Here, it was a toss-up. I even wanted the king to castle. But after d5, I'm like, nah, I'm coming after you. Now, what I should have done here was the move rook e1, which is a little bit more subtle than knight f4. Um... I was relying here on a vague memory and I was too lazy to look it up, so I challenge you to do it before I do. I recall that there was an Anand Sax or Sax game, uh, Dula Sax, um, Hungarian GM, where this exact same motif was played by Anand and he ended up winning. And so that was the focus of my thinking. And so I immediately played he knight f4, but turns out that this is more accurate. Because after knight f4, queen e5 is surprisingly annoying by hitting the bishop. And rook e1, knight e3, I can't retake because f4 hangs. In fact, in this position, the absolutely mind-boggling queen d2 is the engine's recommendation, which is just absolutely outrageous. I suspect the idea is knight e6 with mate. But this is bonkers city. 
even in a long time control game there is no way i would find that move um and yeah otherwise it's it's just not uh, pleasant and if i have to drop back then i feel like we lost a valuable tempo bishop e7 rookie one queen c5 the engine still reckons that there is a bit of an oomph here but it feels like the king is safe and so rookie one was better here believe it or not when the idea is that if they play bishop e7 we can go in for knight e6 immediately and that ladies and gents is how you play against the king castled or rather uncastled and is stuck in the middle the mentality here is so beautiful because there are one two three four pieces between the rock and the king and yet this is where we deliver the damage take e6 excuse me and if queen e6 then knight e4 and now next uh, the bishop moves is going to discover the e file but here comes an extra one after something like queen e5 we even need to throw in g6 now this is a marvel of a move once again no way on earth would i have found this concept of course with the idea of bishop g5 skewering everybody on the e5 this is just absolutely divine chess and why is better so compared to this the game is really lame i played knight f4 and when my opponent played queen c5 i went like nah this doesn't fly obviously the plan was that if the knight moves anywhere e3 hangs but this is way past repair and by now i was so home uh, zoned in on the tactical ideas and i really wanted to score a beautiful uh, win that there was no way that anyone would talk me out of uh, one of these sacks on e6 which completely blasts the position open was played and luckily for me my opponent allowed me a marvelous finish queen takes e3 was followed by uh, the super sexy rookie one which actually after queen f2 allows me two different checkmates i would have picked this one but um, knight takes g7 would have also been a mate. Now, the difference between these two games, once again, was the fact that although I was very well aware of the king's situation here, but I don't think that white strategy can be described as fight against the uncastled king. It became a circumstantial thing. Like, I was prepared for this king to be castled and I don't have a real chance to prevent it from happening. However, when my opponent decided to open up the middle and open up both the d and the e files i just went like nah i'm coming after you bro you're not castling anymore and this is the type of thing that i was talking about in the intro that very often we do not have this mental shift this punisher mode is what i like to call it when you go like nah that doesn't fly i'm going to come after you the third and last example um, but I will play this out again because it's so beautiful uh, of this topic is what in my opinion is the most typical and the hardest one to grasp and uh, and uh, play for and that is, is when the king being uncastled or remaining uncastled comes as a consequence of a different factor in the game which is almost always poor development and we recognize that the poor development is going to lead to an uncastled king and therefore we turn the, way, the game, game that way. Check this out. Um, Wei Yi is playing this game against his opponent. I forgot who it was. And we are heading for, headed for a very quiet looking French. This is as harmless as it can get as far as the French is concerned. But here, Black goes in for c4 trying to shut down this uh entire queen side business and also ridiculing the knight on d2 which has not really a lot of squares to go to uh by the way i do think that there was a very famous game i think between geller and dreyev that featured a similar motive but i may have mis recalled the names anyway so as soon as this happens where he goes like mm -mm, be free note that there is no talk of the king this move is fundamentally about positionally punishing this overambitious move which was designed to create a pawn chain to which way he says no it's not gonna happen because i'm gonna undermine it with a4 and this is purely about pawn chains and understanding how they need to be and must be undermined um, in fact i have spoken about this in many of my videos 
And that is what the game is currently all about. It's exploding this pawn chain, trying to create a weakness in there, punish black for this positionally greedy play. There is no king to talk about. It's two moves away from castling and our pieces are nowhere near in the vicinity. However, in this position, black plays c3. And the plan is that if I drop back, they will play b4. And no matter what white does from here on out, knight f6 castles and black is totally fine. And again, this is the point where you really need that aggressive vision and that evaluating skill that enables you to go like, well, hang on a tick. I can take this, one pawn. I then retake on this, two pawns, a hanging piece, an uncastled king, an open file. If this is not completely winning for white, I don't know what is. But for this, again, it requires a fair bit of calculating ability, correct evaluation, definitely understanding how the game of chess works in terms of you look at this and you go like, well, that knight is hanging. It has to go to one of these two squares. This is how chess is not meant to be played. This is how chess is meant to be played. But a lot of people really do struggle to jump over this hurdle to call it a piece sack and go for it. And they would definitely play knight f1, keeping the material balance, hugging their pieces like there was no tomorrow. In fact, instead of going in for an extremely dynamic kill like this. And from here on out, boy, does he go after this king. And that looks like this. Takes a6, bishop takes, bishop b5 check. And out of nowhere, lo and behold, Black is struggling to survive the next few moves. 97 hangs this. Um, bishop takes, hangs the rook when another pin enters the fray from a new direction. And after king f8, we just go after the king like crazy. And actually, and I really want you to observe this. Before the piece sack, nothing was directed at the black king barring rook e1, right? After the piece sack, from here on out, observe the white moves and see how brutally every single one of them is going after the black king like a vicious predator that smells a wounded prey. Look at this. Check. 95 going in for death. Queen d6, queen h5. Mate in one fret. Punch after punch after punch. g6. Check. No worries. Takes. Check. No worries, king has one square only, king g8, bishop e8, mate threat on f7, thanks for coming. GG game is over. Absolutely marvelous play by Wei Yi, <laughs> who would have thought 2700 GM, right? But still, what I really find absolutely sensational about this game is how he turns a positional blunder, c4, into something entirely different. He undermines it by positional means. But when his opponent tries to stir the pot by going for material, he flops it completely on its head and goes like, okay, matey, well, check out this development and let's see how your king is going to survive the upcoming storm. And from here on out, this vicious aggression from bishop b5-1 is, yeah, just absolutely superb. I absolutely love the way how white handled this attack and it is just the epitome of how you are meant to attack a king stuck in the middle. I hope you guys enjoyed this rather lengthy video. Um, I do think that this is a topic that every now and then we are going to revisit. This is it for me for now. Please don't forget to sub to like to super like. We have made it to 25k subscribers, by the way. So that's a huge milestone by my measure. Let's see if we can make it to 50. That's the next goal. Uh, help me to get there, please. Thanks again for watching and I will be back with the next soon. Bye.